Would you pray with me? You are the God who comes to us, not in power, not in might, but you're the God who meets us in the simple and in the quiet. Today, would you come and be our shepherd? May we, as your, your sheep, hear your voice. And may it shape us, may it mold us, and may it lead us so that we may be in your presence not just in these moments, but all the days of our life. For it's the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. How many of you went to high school? In high school, I don't know if this was true in your school, it wasn't mine, there was a pecking order in the school, a, a case system, if you will, a, a system that you knew exactly where you stood among the crowd. In my high school, the number one group, the top tier were the jocks. If you were a jock, you ruled the school. And to give you away my age, the number two tier were the grunge kids. The grunge kids of the 90s, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all those amazing bands that you all listen to, right? And in my school, that was the jock and then the grunge kids, and then each group had an order that was very clear where you stood. But there was one young man in my ninth grade gym class that, that not only didn't care about the ladder, he in essence kicked the ladder out from everyone else. His name was Steve, and I met him in gym class. And Steve was the happiest guy in any room that he would ever enter. Big smile, full of laughter, and he didn't care what anyone had to say. Well, Steve was a unique individual in our school. Many had labeled him as a student with special needs. But in fact, what Steve was, was a teacher. He was a teacher about humility and about grace and about who cares about pecking orders. And so the first day of gym class, he asked me my name, and I said, David Rivers. And he nicknamed me Rivy. And so whenever I'd walk down the hall and he would see me coming, he would scream out as loud as he could, Rivy. And so I knew whenever Steve was around, because he didn't just give me a new name, he gave everyone a new name. Well, Steve, and as he went into the, the cafeteria, and those people had their table. He didn't care if there was a seat open. He went and sat down anyways, and he would tell jokes that were horrendously bad, but he would laugh so hard at his own jokes, you would laugh too. You see, Steve taught us a lot in that weird world of high school about who's in and who's out, who's on the top t rung of the ladder and who's at the bottom, that it doesn't really matter anyways. What matters is joy. What matters is the way that we engage each other and embrace each other. And for all those years of high school, I would hear Rivi ringing out through the halls as a constant reminder that we're called to be something more than we are by ourselves. You see, the story that we find ourselves in, this Christian narrative, is a story in which Steve becomes the great teacher for all of us about what really matters in life. There's a way that certain individuals can teach us the deeper truths of life, a lot like kids do, about what matters in this world. But we live in a society in a time that's no different than the history, which we have a ladder of tears. And certain groups are up here, and then the middle group, and then always the lowest group. And today I hope that through this image of the Good Shepherd, as Jesus defines himself as the Good Shepherd, you realize that the, the statement that he makes is completely upside down on the rungs of the ladder. Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. Shepherd. And in our world today, there's many of us that have heard that, that word, and we find comfort. 
We find hope. We find a sense of well-being because of it. And that is good. But in the ancient world, that wasn't a good analogy for Jesus to call himself. In John's gospel, when he uses these seven statements, or these I am statements, he's letting us into the understanding of who he is and the way that God is as a person. And so when he says, I am the good shepherd, he's saying that I am at the bottom of the rung. I'm of the lowest of the low. I am the least in the ones that you all don't like. The Mishnah, which is the Jewish writing about their interpretation of the oral law, reflects about the shepherd in this way. They refer to shepherds in belittling terms. One passage describes them as incompetent. You get that? The shepherd is described as incompetent. Another says that no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. Smug religious leaders maintained a strict case system at the expense of shepherds and other common folk. Shepherds were officially labeled sinners, a technical term for a class of despised people. Do you get what is happening here? Jesus doesn't come in power and in might He doesn't come as an elitist. He comes as a nobody. And uses the persona of a nobody to describe who he actually is. And the phrase that so many of us find comfort in of the good shepherd is actually a statement about how powerless he actually is in his own society. He's a throwaway. He's the one that the religious people would look past and and try to get away from them. He is not of the elite. And don't we find great comfort in that? Jesus didn't come walking around calling the most brilliant. He didn't go around calling the most successful. He didn't go around calling those that knew the most. He went around calling those that were willing. Willing for the kingdom of God to expand right before their eyes. And in our world today, God still calls out to all of us, not because of our status or of our intellect. God calls out to us because of our willingness, a willingness to follow. So throughout our scriptures, we have this image of a shepherd. In the ancient world with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the shepherd was the primary task of the community. They were, they were herders. And they moved their sheep along. But as they went into Egypt, they suddenly left the shepherding ways and began to be a people of agrarian culture. They grew stuff. And for 400 years, they lived in this community in which the Egyptians despised shepherds. And as, e- as Israel left Egypt, they left with a, de- dis- uh, what's the word? A-, a desire to not be shepherds ever again. Instead, they left to go into this promised land to be a better kind of people, not those shepherds. And then we come to a guy who is appointed king, but before he's king, he is shepherd. And as Samuel is calling Jesse to bring his sons forth to find the new king, he brings the eldest, the rightful heir, the one who everyone would expect to be king. And Samuel looks at him and says, nope. And then the next son comes and he says, nope, until finally he doesn't bring any more sons before Samuel. And Samuel asks, by chance do you have another son? And Jesse says, oh yeah, the shepherd boy. You don't want him. He's the the forgotten son, the, the son that can't do anything other than tend the flock. And Samuel says, bring him forth. And as we know the story, he takes a slingshot and slays the giant and becomes king. And he writes a psalm that is read at almost every funeral that begins by the statement, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then we flip to the New Testament and 
this baby is born to this young woman and her, her engaged husband. And the first visitors to the manger aren't the powerful, they aren't the religious, they are shepherds. The least, the last, the despised. And then Jesus in John's Gospel takes on the persona of a shepherd by saying, I am the good shepherd. Wow. For those that believe Jesus is about power and about ensuring that that we're of an elite group, what he says to us is I'm about humility and simplicity. And let's get rid of the ladders and learn how to be together. And so in this 10th chapter, what we discover is that what we need as a people is not a religious zealot who would point out our wrongs. What we don't need is a doctor who can give a diagnosis of our problems. We certainly don't need a self-help guru so that we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and fix ourselves. What we need is a shepherd who can lead us and protect us. Do you get that? We are people that need someone that leads us and protects us. And so as he goes into this statement about, I am the good shepherd, the first thing he says is, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am the one that will go to the nth degree to protect you, to be with you so that you never get into trouble if you're following me. And when you do get into trouble, I will come to your rescue. Isn't that great news? That when you and I go astray, God doesn't look to punish us. God doesn't look to push us away, but instead God comes seeking us. And the second statement of the good shepherd in this passage was that I know the sheep And they know me. They know my voice. There's an intimacy about the good shepherd and his sheep. They can discern the voice of God and hear it and follow. Are you listening for the voice of God in your own life? Do you have this relationship that you actually know what that voice sounds like so that we can be led into green pastures and besides still waters, a place in which all of our needs are met and we find abundance. The job of the shepherd is quite simple, to lead and to protect. The job of the sheep are equally as simple, to follow. That's it. What is the story of the gospel? It's a story of following. And that God goes to the great lengths to show the humility of God by coming to us in a form that we can accept. Psalm 23 is this interesting psalm of the role of the shepherd in our lives. Paul Miller in his book, The Praying Life, looks at Psalm 23. If you remove the shepherd... And the imagery of what the shepherd does from the psalm, and listen to how it reads. Psalm 23, without the shepherd. My, I shall be in want. Me, me, my soul, me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear me, me. Me in the presence of my enemies, my head, my cup. Me, all the days of my life, I will dwell. You see, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense without the shepherd, does it? It really is all about me. But Psalm 23 is a reminder for us that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He 
restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup, my cup, it overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for my whole life long. You see, the psalm that's too often only read at funerals instead of read into our lives today is an invitation. It's an invitation to follow a shepherd who calls to us, who walks along a sea and looks at fishermen and screams out, come and follow me, and walks along the paths of life and finds the tax collectors and thieves and says, come and follow me and walks among the prostitutes and says, come and follow me, and finds those that are addicted that says, come and follow me, that goes among the religious establishment who think they have it all together but don't, and says, come and follow me. For those that are poor, he says, come and follow me, and for those that are rich, come and follow me. For those that are brand new on the journey or have been on this journey for a life, come and follow me. For those that want green pasture and cool water, come and follow me. For those of us that want to live a life of abundance, come and follow me. The invitation is to each and every one of us. Come and follow me. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime decision. It's an every-moment-of-every-day decision. Today, Jesus says, I am your good shepherd. Come and follow me. May it be so among us. Amen.